just because that sounds right. I mean, for what it looks like. So it's like, yeah, maybe. Yeah, it's uh, it's German, so that'll do it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are here with Justin Schwanka. For everyone out there who's never heard or said his name, that's how you say it. We just <laughs> I was one of those people who had no idea. But we're here. Uh where are you at right now? Uh I live in Abbotsford, BC. Uh so Western Canada. Nice. Used to live in used to live in Alberta. That's where I spent most of my life. Wow, that is what was that again? Abbotsford. It's like 45 minutes from Vancouver. Cool. I'm just pulling up Google Maps so I can like kind of have an idea. It's so crazy to me that, wow, you're about as far as you can go. Literally almost as far as you can go is west. Yeah. We're, uh, our city is like right on the border. So we literally border Washington. Wow. That's wild. So what's the weather there like right now? Uh, it's like typical Pacific Northwest kind of climate. It's nice today. Um, I don't know what it is in Fahrenheit, but in Celsius, it's like 13 degrees Celsius, somewhere around there. Gotcha. Yeah. Right on. Well, I think it's so amazing that the internet exists and we can talk to each other. Literally, we are thousands and thousands of miles away, and it's just cool. All Absolutely. because of BMX. <laughs> Absolutely. So I think people would recognize you first and foremost from Weird and Revered. And mm -hmm. uh, I, well, we got people jumping in here. Uh, oh, fat guy BMX. What's up, Stoney? Uh, so can you tell me, like, is Weird and Revered, is it just like a crew? Is it you? What What is Weird and Revered at its core? Yeah, it's definitely a crew. Um I was, it was kind of my brainchild, I guess. Uh, my friends jokingly, like jokingly kind of refer to me as the CEO. And then I put that back on them and say, chief entertainment officer. <laughs> uh, and the guy who makes the videos. Yeah. But, um, yeah. It's just like a crew of, crew of riders. Um, mostly started in Edmonton and Alberta where I used to live. Um, I've been making, I've been making videos forever since I was like 13 years old. And for a really long time, I didn't really have a crew or a name behind it. It was just, here's Justin's new video. So in like 20, I think like 2015 ish, I decided once I had, was kind of meeting more people and kind of building a little bit BMX community, then I decided to kind of make a name to it. I got a friend to drop a logo and then we started a crew. Um, and then the videos just all went under the weird and revered name. And then kind of over time as we progressed and um, kind of where I wanted it to go was to make a DVD project, like a local scene DVD. And so then we started that in 20, late 2016, like the very end of 2016, and then filmed that for three years. And then we had a DVD come out in 2019 and then we're working on the next one. That's a pretty long-term thing. I don't know when that'll be done. And then just always making web videos and that kind of thing. Nice. That's, that's crazy because I feel like I've, my memories of like the name weird and revered are further back than 2015. <laughs> yeah. And that could, that could just be videos with my name on it or friends and videos, but there was no weird and revered like label to it. So. Yeah. Uh, like the you're the you have the ramps in like the grass right had yeah had. Had, had. okay had well i know those videos those are how yeah. i like know who you are and stuff and and those videos are always awesome to watch and and then connect that to weird and revered and where everything's at today but those ramps i wanted to talk about those ramps because how there's not many other that many other people who are dedicated enough to ride in ramps on grass like what's the story with these ramps yeah so i grew up um in a rural area outside of edmonton like 45 minutes away so it was just on an acreage it wasn't like a full farm or anything yeah um so we had lots of land and growing up we built little ramps, little dirt jumps, that kind of thing. Uh, I used to race BMX as well, but just 
always like jumping my bike, building stuff, going to the skate park, whatever. Yeah. So being in a rural area and not having a car, you're a little kid, you just sort of build what you can and ride what you can where you live. So my dad was super helpful in that. Like we built our first little ramps together. Um, uh, my brother and I would, when he used to ride BMX, we'd build jumps and stuff. And then kind of the first like big transformation point where it became like a, I'd, I'd say a skate park. Uh, there was an indoor park in Thorsby, Alberta, another kind of like middle of nowhere, small town. They had a crazy indoor skate park for years um and then it closed down after uh it kind of like closed reopened closed and then it sort of had its end point and we got connected to the 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 town and they were trying to get rid of the ramps at first they were trying to sell them and we we weren't gonna pay money for them we didn't have money to Mm. buy ramps but eventually they decided to give them all away under the condition that you can get them all out of there and you do the full deconstruction project yourself so the ramps were all built inside um, an arena um, there's some like hockey rinks in there where they were it wasn't necessarily where the hockey rink was but like an arena type of facility um, so all the ramps had to come out a zamboni sized door <laughs> uh, and the ramps are obviously way bigger than this door right um, so it was like crazy, like deconstruction project, multiple weekends with my dad and my brother, a bunch of friends, like trucks, trailers, taking apart ramps, loading them up and then driving them to my parents' acreage. So that was like a big project. And then we, my, my parents, their property, they have a bunch of fields. Uh, there's like a few fields, we used to have horses and stuff. And so we plotted all the ramps back there and then uh that's where it started with it becoming kind of a skate park Hmm. and then the next one after that there was an old contest series uh in edmonton called six and 64 street justice um edmonton had a like a distro company a parts company called six and 64 and they had this contest for many years and it like they they'd fly in riders in the u.s and stuff like the snm snm guys were there um, Beringer rode in there, Aiken, Dakota Roche. Um, so they were like the Canadian distro for like Fit and S&M and a bunch of different brands. So that contest eventually, its lifespan kind of came to an end. The ramps were sitting at their uh, warehouse for many years. And um, my first job was working for the guy that ran 1664. His name was Bernie Thomas Suski. I think I was saying his last name right. Um, but he also owned a bike shop. It's called Transition BMX, and that's where I worked. And so one day he just said, like, these ramps are sitting here. Do you want more? And so then uh, I was like a teenager at the time. So I had a lot of convincing to do to do with my father and my mom to um, adopt another skate park. <laughs> <laughs> adopt another skate park. That's a good way they to already, put it. They already had one, and they're like, <laughs> want more? <laughs> It's not a dog. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. So luckily I had pretty supportive parents and uh, my dad was into it. So that was like the next project. It was way less work than the deconstructing the indoor park. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we got some ramps from that and uh, yeah, set them up on grass. I would kind of like shovel little trench kind of run-ins between ramps sometimes. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, it worked for what it was. Some people hated riding it and they couldn't ride it. Like I had lots of friends that were super keen to come out and ride. Others liked kind of the novelty of these sketchy ramps because they weren't in the best condition Mm -hmm. uh, on grass and kind of a little more like hillbilly style, I guess. But yeah, 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 that's definitely like where I really grew my skills riding and uh, kind of what I, yeah i became in canada especially like who's the guy with the skate park on grass (laughs) i mean it's easy to see why i have a picture of it pulled up and it's like crazy to look at the picture is from uh bmx union's backyard 
BMX Paradise or something or yeah, Backyard BMX Paradise was the post. It's when the ramps are blue and then there's like the big white ramp in the back <laughs> and ha- like did, all of it got road I assume at some point, but like how do you ride on grass? <laughs> like how does that work? There's there's one picture where you're blasting the box jump. Yeah, it's well, so actually the color, just to your comment about the color difference, so all the blue ramps were from the 1664 Street Justice contest. Some of them had like contest logos still on them. Yeah, and then all oh, the I can see ones, the Fit logo, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And all the white ones are from uh, Thorsby, the indoor skate park. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It was kind of set up on a hill. So like, like a really mellow hill. So the box jump line would go down the hill uh-huh. and then that worked fine like you there was no issue for speed and then you'd hit sort of like a there's an eight foot quarter at the bottom and then you kind of had to like pedal hard and pump really hard to go back up the hill yeah but it worked and then um yeah there was a couple different lines like going down the hill and then at the bottom where it was like totally flat there was like kind of quarters bank set up uh the one quarter that had a deck was there at the bottom so yeah i mean it it depend it just really depended on how much work I put in like shoveling grass. Yeah. Just like using a spade and just cutting the grass off till it's dirt. And you'd have to do that all the time because like the grass would sort of grow back in and yeah, like when you're riding trails there's like a, a set line that everyone hits and like you don't have to worry worry about like grass growing in because it's getting like worn down. But there there was like so many lines so just was sort of a matter of maintenance of building the trenches or just like being fine with pedaling on grass and using your racer legs. Right. So, so you have a pretty unique style. Do you think that it is due to having to ride this unique setup? Yeah. It's like definitely a big part of it. Um, I think my like interest in riding have definitely evolved a lot over the years. Um, like when I was younger riding, it was definitely kind of racer influence, like kind of go fast, land smooth, pump around, just sort of jump. And then um, over the years, I got way more interested in street riding. Um, and that's kind of where I'm most, like what I'm most interested in today is sort yeah. of like creative, sort of oddball street riding. Yeah. But all those like foundational tricks and bike control definitely came from riding those ramps and it is also a place like that was in my backyard i rode there all the time and so i always sort of think of this uh i kind of wrote about it recently but this idea of like constraints mm-hmm. and innovation and how you think about obstacles um i kind of at first i didn't have a lot to ride eventually i had lots to ride but i was always stuck in the same place so when you don't have like tons of different options to you, your constraints force, oops, sorry. Oops. That was an alarm. Your, uh, your constraints force you to think differently. Mm-hmm. So I spent all that time back there. It's kind of like you and your Lip Lords video. Like yeah, exactly. Your constraint is literally a deck of a ramp and a quarter pipe. And so the more time you spend on that, the more you're forced to come up with new stuff because that's all you have. Mm-hmm. So I was definitely like, I'm not saying I wasn't spoiled to have a whole skate park, but that's what I rode. And that's all I rode for a really long time. So I think that's kind of where the more creative style came from. I, I think it's cool. And I feel like I can appreciate more than maybe some people, the fact that like, I'll, you're well known in BMX, people know who you are. And it comes from that constraint of that's what you rode every day and it's not like like did you were you traveling to california and being in front of all of these people or was that just what you rode and then you started traveling later like what was the evolution of that yeah i've done lots of traveling i i don't know if i'm like that known in bmx like as far as like my name per se uh i think if someone showed them like a video uh, or the backyard or a weird new video and be like, oh, that's that guy. 
but as far as like me and Justin Schwanka, like I don't think I have a ton of name recognition and most of the traveling I've done and BMX projects I've done have kind of been like self-organized and mm -hmm. created or with friends or whatever. Um, so yeah, like and now I think more recently I'm kind of seeing some opportunities of um, people coming to me with ideas or things to work on or opportunities. Um, before it was definitely just trying to create those myself and or just doing things with friends and whatever and tons of that traveling um, was definitely for the weird and weird DVD like we, we did a ton of traveling filming for that yeah I just feel like I can relate so much to the the self like doing it yourself and not having to like you just go to the place where everyone's at and then things happen it's like you yeah. did what you did and got to where you're at by using what you had where you're at rather than traveling to where everyone is and i i think it's so cool yeah i think i think too like i obviously my like biggest passion is bmx and filming like mm -hmm. that is just that is my reason I'm here to exist and do stuff. Like I know that in my heart, like so much, but I think sometimes when I was younger, I was like, Oh, should I just like somehow move to California and be a BMX bum? Like I thought about that as a kid. It's yeah. really hard to like do that, especially from another country like Canada and going there and you need visas and or a work permit and so on. But I'm like, I'm pretty glad, like I'm very glad I didn't take that path because I went to like I went to university, went to business school. I have a career in business now, and all of that stuff has sort of like set me up a lot better for BMX stuff mm. later on. Because I built like a foundational skill set of okay, how do you organize a trip? Like how do you manage your expenses? How do you do marketing? Like how can I obviously just like self learning video stuff and filming, but like even the DVD, like how do we bring all these people together? How do we organize? How do I motivate people? Like it's kind of like leading a mini team a little bit. Oh yeah. It's definitely a collaborative thing. It's not like a top down approach, but mm -hmm. all that I think is, is important. Cause I think if you just sort of go the approach of, oh yeah, I'm just gonna like go for it willy nilly. Like it's gonna like hurt for a while. Like, if you want to just go be a BMX bum in California, I think one you, you one benefit is you're going to be connected to the right people, so that can that can change things. But it's important to also learn these other skills, and you can get them from different paths. Like you don't necessarily need to go to school for it or whatever. But um, yeah, I think all those other skills you develop in life are often more important or as important as like the actual activity that you want to do and figuring out how to do it. So in my case, riding a bike and filming. That totally makes sense. And I think it makes it even cooler that you made a conscious decision to not do that. And I think it's m even more admirable. And then the, the act of filming a full length DVD and doing all of the projects that you've done without the help of a TM or someone like you became the role of that that like organizer not necessarily i mean you the ceo there you go you you became this the ceo aka tm of like all of what you're trying to organize and do and you're doing it all yourself and I, it's just it's so relatable to everything that i've like tried to do in bmx too because i i knew you know years and years ago that you could just go to california and if you're good enough it'll just kind of work out because you're there and you're with everyone and you're good enough but if you stay somewhere like you know the backyard ramp that's in grass or the four foot prefab woodward ramp in the middle of ohio it's going to be harder but like my thing was i just always wanted to be like able to say like i made it from this ramp from this four foot yeah. prefab woodward ramp and the fact that you consciously decided to do what you did and then set yourself up even more so is it's cool yeah and i like i don't feel like i'm there yet like i i feel like i'm i 
I'm seeing a little bit more opportunities now, but for a long time, like I said, it was just sort of all what I was trying to create out of passion. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I think kind of like respecting or appreciating where you come from and like you don't necessarily have to abandon that to get to where you want to go. So like, like you said, you can ride a ramp, one ramp in Ohio and like do something cool with BMX if you find the right path of how to do that that's the challenge right yep but and then the other part too is like finding the balance of all the other things you want to do in life like okay so if i went and moved to california and i was took the bmx bomb path not saying that's necessarily a bad decision but like i wouldn't have met my partner my wife now like i wouldn't be as close to family i wouldn't have just met the friends i have i recently like a year and a half ago, moved to BC. I wouldn't have met friends here. But I've been as connected to my friends at home in Alberta, um, or just the other like passions or goals in life, or financially, or whatever. So it's striking the balance. Like you can go like all in, and that can work out sometimes. Or you can sort of like do pieces and kind of figure out more strategically how to get where you want to go. But it's a gamble. Like you're not necessarily going to know right from the get-go what the right path is and it's sort of what the struggle is and there's like learning and fun and experience in that it's journey as cliche as that sounds it's the beauty of life right nobody knows what we're doing no we don't know what the heck we're doing we guess and we kind of try to guide the path but like we're really at the end of the day like that that's one thing i remember when you finally realize once you become an adult and then you realize that all the other adults are pretty much just like putting on a face and pretending so that kids take them seriously. <laughs> but in reality, everyone's doing this almost the same thing of just like, I don't know what's going on, but we're going to try and make it work. Yeah, I, that's just picking up on that. That's one thing like I know I need to work on. I'm trying to work on, but like showing vulnerability is like the quickest way to build relationships with people. Like showing what, not necessarily fully insecurities, but definitely your vulnerabilities. What what are you trying to do? What is not working? Like what struggles you're going through? You meet people that way, mm -hmm. and then you also like can connect to new ideas. So something I've often done is I'll just like hit people up cold, sometimes with an, an introduction if I have one, and ask for someone's time to like learn something or figure mm -hmm. something out or like run ideas by um i'm working on this it's like a massive long-term project but it's a documentary film series for our bmx called project spoke and i'd never made a documentary before i began this project and in some ways perhaps naively i decided to do like a series before doing one doc but there was sort of a plan behind that but like i knew i didn't have all the skills and so i just like hit up people called and said hey would you have like 30 minutes of time to chat with me and like came prepared wrote down some questions of like what I want to learn and then they you talk to them and like people are just generally usually excited to share some knowledge and then maybe they connect you to someone else and and kind of going back to what we were talking about before like you don't necessarily have to go to school to do that academia or school can help with certain things but like there are other ways to learn. Like you can take an online course on something or watch a YouTube video or just like connect with people and ask them questions. So that's that's something I've definitely found helpful. Oh, 1000%. And if there's one thing that's for sure, it's that people love talking about themselves and what they do. And if you ask them for advice on the thing that they love, and that they do for themselves, they are going to want to help you, unless they're an asshole, but that that's not very often. Uh, it's it's interesting to, to hear the, all of these things too, and uh, I just, I relate so much to everything you talk about too, in that like, I wish that I didn't go to school for video, because I, BMX pretty much taught me video, and like, I, to, it takes this long to figure it out but like i think the best way to learn how to do anything is to have something that you want to do bad enough that you'll figure out how to get it done 
no matter what you what it takes and i think that's like yeah. a bmx mentality almost totally and i think that's where like having a project is so helpful because like you think this is more business speak but like there's this um phrase called your like big hairy audacious goal and so it's like what's the big thing you want to achieve what is it and then you like sort of break it down in parts and so let's say it's make a dvd like okay i want to make a dvd maybe i don't have the skills to get there yet and then you sort of identify okay what do i like need to learn sometimes you don't actually know what you need to learn and then you figure that out as you go and then you realize oh hey i thought i knew so much and then i know nothing yeah. but like at least starting out it's like okay hey, there's these pieces like maybe I need like two more years of filming before I feel confident in like making a really good DVD. So then I'm going to make some web videos or like, I guess backing up from that, like what going way back is just, I'm just going to film clips of my friends, like mm. maybe put them on Instagram or something. Okay. Next I'm going to like make some web videos and like learn editing or like get my filming better. And then, okay, let's take the leap to the next one. And like, let's say it's a DVD. Okay. <laughs> this is what I need to work on with filming. Like, these are the people I want to organize. What do I want it to look like? Watch a bunch of videos, like kind of make notes, take ideas, develop a vision, and then figure out what the gaps are. Mm -hmm. So I think having a project of some kind is like a very quick way to learn skills. Yeah. Because otherwise you're just sort of like, you're drifting around. You don't really know where you're going you can and you can just be doing these one-off sort of activities um but it's not necessarily um working towards something and then allowing yourself to develop all those skills as you get there and uh what do they call it whenever they give you a thing it's when you're in school even college whatever it might be it's a project <laughs> Yeah, totally. <laughs> Everything that you do in school is like based on projects. So like exactly what you said just makes sense. Uh, I remember just a bit ago, you made a comment about starting filming when you were 13, which is kind of ironic because that's when I started filming too. How old are you? I'm 27. I'm 28. So we are <laughs> the same person, but oh, uh, US and Canada. <laughs> we also have the same birthday, remember? Bro. <laughs> that's fucked up what okay all right so you started filming when you were 13 you're one year younger than me so it would have been a year after i did let's let's go all the way back how does that start yeah so at that time like the only person i really rode with was my brother so he didn't uh he doesn't ride anymore but for many years it was just him and i riding in the backyard and then like the odd friends that were kind of like biking hobbyists, I guess they weren't necessarily BMXers, but oh, they were yeah. friends that like to ride a bike off a jump or something. So yeah, I was, I wanted to get into filming, I guess maybe backing up what inspired that, um, fit life was definitely like the video that got me super excited about, uh, freestyle. Mm -hmm. I sort of loosely ridden freestyle all the time. I started racing at six years old and then I was still like jumping my bike off of things and like if I could get my parents to take me to a skate park I'd ride it. But So you had knowledge I, of what BMX and freestyle was like way before that then? Yeah, but I wasn't like interested or I wouldn't say I wasn't aware of the culture. Yeah, right. Okay. When I saw Fit Life and also Rogue, Rogue Fools like I think Road Pools 11 and 12 were like the first ones I got. That's kind of my era, I guess. Um, yeah, but Fit Life, I watched that video and I'm like, this is so sick. How can I be a part of this? I'm so excited about this. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that was the video. I'm like, I decided, okay, I, I want to buy a video camera. So I just, whatever, saved up money as a kid. Um, I've always been pretty frugal, so it was. I don't know if it was allowance money or doing odd jobs or whatever. I don't really remember. Yeah. But I got, I bought a video camera. Um, it had those like mini DVD tapes. Dude, this, is, this is like messed up because 
I started on a point and shoot, like one of the first point and shoot digital cameras, but then my mom had one of those DVD camcorders that I would use too. <laughs> Yeah, I was. Just, I had a Sony Handy Cam. That was my. That's favorite. what my mom's was. <laughs> yeah. That's so messed up. Anyways. So yeah, I started filming on that. It was mostly like me filming my brother, and then him filming me, and more so him filming me than me filming him. Um, and uh, I edited the videos. I had Windows Movie Maker. Oh yeah. And uh, just, I think my first my first video. The, all my old old videos are on pink bike like they're still up there wow my vimeo account got deleted somewhere along the line so all that stuff's gone but it, everything is kind of backed up i guess it's all on pink bike so my very first video didn't have music i think it was called backyard sessions or something like that and then i think the next one had music and then i just kept working at it and trying to get better at editing and whatever and the videos were horrible for a long time and my writing was also not good like I just my skills weren't developed and whatever but I mean when you're a kid that doesn't matter and right. in hindsight like I I still I actually some people um, don't like watching their old stuff I watch my old stuff kind of regularly not like all the time but I'll yeah. go back every now and then. I'll be like, oh, I'm going to watch this video from like 10 years ago or whatever. Yeah. And what I love about it is you're sort of like taken back to the mindset that you were when you were a kid doing that. And it's like, yeah, all I could do was 180. This video is all 180s. That's all it is. <laughs> yep. I think I just learned that I didn't have many skills. But there's something like kind of um, pure in that or beautiful in that. It's like, no, that's just like how old I was and this thing I was working on and something I was excited. It's about. a time capsule. Exactly. That's yeah. the way I look at videos because I have videos from the time I started up till now. And, and that's, I do the same thing. Like every now and then you get in that kick where you're like, Oh, I remember about this video. So then I go back and watch that when you watch a couple leading up to today and it's like, it's just cool. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. And I, I I say to people like you don't have to be embarrassed about like your past or what your skills were before or now like it, it just doesn't matter unless you're a really big jerk or something <laughs> but yeah so so you started on the uh, the handicam DVD camera film and videos they're on pink bike how do things progress um, what was the next camera how long did you film yeah, next that one yeah, next camera was probably around 16 or 17 years old. That would have Maybe been. That. It was a Canon Vixia HFM 52, which is a dad cam, but it was HD. Yeah, it was like it was one of those old hard drive cameras. Yeah, exactly. So before that, it was just SD, low quality footage. Then it was HD. By that point, somewhere along the line, I got in a better editing program. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it was on one of the, I don't know when I got Adobe Premiere, but there were some like weird random ones in between there that I didn't really stick with. But yeah, and I think a big part of it was just like, really, I guess what really changed is once I got my license at 16, I could spend more time away from home and meet people. Mm -hmm. I always grew up in a rural place I wasn't like I wasn't super far away from everything it was 45 minutes from a big city like of a million people but there weren't really many riders right where I lived once I was of driving age then I started to meet people go to the skate park find people to film with build friends community yeah and that kind of thing so yeah. and then then after that would be kind of what we were talking about earlier around 2015 was weird and weird seven years ago so that have been you've been 20 man that's so crazy so how many videos would you say you made before weird and revered was a thing like rough guess just a super rough guess i don't know like a lot was it 50 lot? so it was a lot, lot. Lots, yeah, lots. That's... And I never really, 
I mean, this is before social media was a thing. So mm -hmm. I didn't just film clips and I put have a clip and put it somewhere. Yeah. I always made videos. Right. And edited videos. So, yeah, I, like 50, I don't know. Post them on MySpace. Like, <laughs> yeah. hey, share this, share for share. Pick comment <laughs> for pick comment. Check out my YouTube page. I remember those days, man, When because it, it gets cold where we live. Like, it gets even colder, I'm sure, where you live. So, like, it's winter time. You made these videos. Did you have an indoor park growing up? They came and went. So there was that, that Thorsby one was, like, the uh, sort of the scene staple. Mm -hmm. And that, it's, like, it's end years were when I was really starting to get into freestyle yeah there was another one called the warehouse in Sherwood Park which is another suburb of Edmonton and it kind of ended around the same time <laughs> Thorsby um, was gone and then I was lucky to also have indoor an indoor setup in my dad's uh, shop uh. so we took just two quarter pipes and squeezed them in there and uh, yeah so I was very privileged to be able to ride that especially when there were no indoors and then over the years there was would randomly be an indoor and then it'd be gone and right they came and went right now edmonton has a really good indoor it's not where i live anymore but uh it's called house of wheels super good people really supportive of bmx and all kind of sports and it seems to i know covid was really hard but it seems to be a bit more sustainable than the rest Cool. Set, set it up with a shop and I think scooters probably keep the place in business but yeah well that's uh that's Changa here in Ohio yeah that man it's it's just cool to hear and I don't know I feel like I'm enjoying this a lot just because we have such similar stories in BMX as weird as that is it it's a wonder that we weren't born on the exact same day like <laughs> same age same day same thing started filming at 13 filmed on this random thing because you didn't want to move to california <laughs> like made this video series or crew whatever you want to call it like that's so cool so at this point what you were filming the weird and reveres on the uh oh uh, Beatrice, she's on the other side of Canada, the Bloom BMX. Yeah. Uh, she's in the chat. But uh, did you start filming Weird and Revered with the Vixia, or was there another camera after that that started Weird and Revered? Um, I think it was with the Vixia. I had a GoPro too. Yeah. That was like my fish eye. There you <laughs> go. I, I think a lot of them. people did that though. Yeah. And then uh, once I started the DVD, I, or a little bit before the DVD, I bought like a mirrorless Sony mm. A6000 yeah. fisheye lens and then just had the kit lens, the long lens. Mm -hmm. And I still have that camera. I still have that Vixia dad cam. I don't use it too much, but if I need a good rocker zoom, oh yeah, it'll be B-roll or something, or I just want to take it out of the bag and film something strange happening. Uh and then I got a sony a6300 and uh i have like the portrait lens now for the documentary stuff but i i'm not a camera nerd like same thing with i'm not a bike nerd either like i don't really care about the gear or the specs or whatever that's sort so of the, wild. the cliches whatever i'm sure you've heard this many people have heard this the best camera is the one you have so chase jarvis man the best camera is the one you have with you Oh, is that in the chat? I don't see that. No, that's the guy who said it. Oh. <laughs> Chase Char oh. is the photographer who said that. Oh, that's oh he's like a famous photographer? Yeah, he's a real big name. I only know of him because there was a, a YouTube channel called Digital Rev TV that would mm -hmm. do uh, cheap camera professional photographer challenges. And so they yeah. bring in these like huge name photographers and give them like a Barbie camera and make them do... <laughs> real like make them do street photography or something with these super crappy cameras so of course like they get chase jarvis the guy who said that quote on there and just make him use the biggest piece of junk camera that they can find and there's a whole series of those that's it's crazy though that that you're not aren't a bike nerd or a camera nerd but you're like 
you do both as passionately as you do. Well, uh, yeah, I'll clarify that. I'm not a bike nerd or a camera nerd, but I'm a riding nerd and a filming nerd. Yeah. Like I, like, if someone wants to talk to me about bike parts and like what's on my bike or the latest technology, I kind of glaze over. Mm-hmm. It's just there's nothing wrong with that stuff. Like I think everyone has different like things they're super excited about in BMX. And yeah. For some people, it's like products, and that's cool. But for me, it's definitely more. Um, the riding and what you're doing with it doesn't matter what it is. One th- one reason I like I sometimes when I talk to people about who don't know like BMX culture or know what BMX is, and I I kind of pride BMX on this. I'll say one cool thing about BMX is that maybe compared to say mountain biking or something, is if you go to the skate park and there's someone there with the worst bike ever, but they like ride it super super hard and like. Mm-hmm. they're going for it or they're just really talented that's the coolest thing ever oh yeah but if you're like the guy at the skate park with the nicest fanciest bike and you're not really riding that well or like not not necessarily riding well but like not passionate or like in it you're, you're just, just not sort of riding like, at all <laughs> yeah that's not cool and and yeah. so i think that's one thing i i think is so awesome about bmx is like kind of that uh diy rough around the edges ethos yeah is, uh, you make the most of what you have and whether that's like crappy spots or like a crappy bike or whatever just like even the idea of street riding or riding in general and getting hurt trying stuff i think that's that's usually what i the anecdote i use to describe bmx as someone who doesn't really understand the cultural piece of it yeah, the, we all know that one person who at one point in time or another, maybe even it's always, just had the crappiest bike in the group but rode harder and better than anybody else. Yeah. We all know that guy. Um, I forgot to ask when we were still talking about cameras. Do you still have the Handycam DVD camera? Uh, might be in my parents' house somewhere. It, I didn't get rid of it. It's... It's somewhere. somewhere. I don't think I brought it with me when I moved, but I haven't used that thing in ages. <laughs> if you find it, we should do another one of these and just gather all of our old cameras together and just do like, this is the one we started on. This is the next one. Cause I still have it, all of them too. Yeah. All of them, except for like, I think one, which is, yeah. I'm mo- like two of them are sitting right here, but uh so so we're now we're coming to more towards the the present and that filming passion i noticed uh seems to have gotten you to go on that trip with the colony people were you the one documenting that or were you there riding too no uh that was fully a filming thing um i was just uh connecting with Adam Watkins at Arab BMX um, about the documentary project I'm working on. Yeah. Uh, just kind of planning out travel dates for it. Everything got like messed up with COVID. I, uh, I'll keep this anecdote kind of brief, but I left in January of 2020 to go start filming that documentary series and it mm-hmm. was traveling all over the place and it was supposed to go to the end of April and obviously March of 2020, the world changed a lot. Yep. So when that happened, I was in at that point in Albuquerque and then I had to come home. Um, so I came home and then everything's kind of been sitting on hold. Yeah. So anyways, now this year that things are opening up, I'm gonna go traveling again for that project. So I was just doing some planning with Adam about that and dates and whatever. And then he mentioned that um, they were just trying to find someone available to film uh, that colony trip. Yeah. Uh, just with the existing guys he had, everyone was busy or schedules didn't align. So that's kind of how that opportunity came. And then I, I knew Steve, uh, Steve Woodward from, I'm doing what, one of the documentaries I'm doing is on his story. Oh, so nice. Steve and I have become good friends. So had that connection and then yeah, uh, I got to go to Arizona in February and film Joey Bataglia, Steve, and Patty, uh, Patty Gross. 
and um, that video will actually be out on Monday. Nice. What a and group the, of people. Yeah, it was it was an awesome trip because the all those guys ride totally different. Yeah. Oh they're like yeah. A, they're all a bit older, so they have um, a lot more maturity to their riding, mm -hmm. like how they approach spots and setups and what they want to film and the tricks they do. And everyone at breaks. Yo. And uh, yeah, just super diverse group. All the personalities totally different. Um, Steve is a uh, Steve's like pretty quiet and reserved, and his re riding sort of speaks volumes. Uh, and then um, he does like he's like one of the best park riders of all time, I would argue for sure. Oh, yeah, very uh, underrated. And then Joey's like the master of brake moves and spinning like a top, kind of more of a loud personality and but with like a really good heart. Mm -hmm. And then Patty's uh, like pretty humorous, really sensitive guy, like yeah. an emotional guy in the best way, um, which is super cool and can be really vulnerable. And uh, yeah, he's like technical front brake, pegs, lip tricks, kind of throwback style to the era of Vasato and all those guys. So yeah, the dynamics of everyone riding and then the personalities is just really good crew guys so. i cannot wait to see this video yeah that's uh, good yeah. those three people are just they make one big tech machine and all together i that's gonna be good yeah i hope people like it they uh they're definitely talented so we hope i think we might try to recreate that trip at some point yeah not necessarily to arizona but the same crew so mm-hmm that's kind of up in the air right now. We're just sort of talking about that, but I'd nice. love to get together with those guys again for moment something. So was that your first uh, like gig other than Project Spoke? Mm, well, Project Spoke was kind of like my creation, and then I found a partner for oh, it, okay. our BMX. So they didn't come to me. I kind of built out a plan. I gotcha. um, did a bunch of research. I, I basically made like a proposal um so that was that one i've done random little freelance things like uh feast was in edmonton for a number of years so mm -hmm. i was working for it was through the city of edmonton but um it was basically doing promo jam events and videos to promote that and then feast also had a magazine an online one i don't know if they still do but i had like i did an article in there about the Edmonton scene. Um, I helped Fudger film the Toyota Triple Challenge a couple of years ago um, when I was actually doing Project Spoke. Um, then I do like kind of freelance, uh, non-BMX stuff, corporate stuff hmm. sometimes. I don't really do much, try not to do much of that. I don't um, have a ton of passion for it, but right. something comes up. So I've done like little bits of pieces but um most of the stuff is just passion projects for sure That's but i cool. yeah I, I definitely hope to be um be able to do more stuff um more opportunities of filming and people asking me if i can help that'd be awesome yeah man just being in the industry that way and just it's cool it feels good yeah um so that brings us pretty pretty much to the present at this point and and i guess i feel like we've gotten to a point where we can talk about the uh the project that you did recently which is the the whole reason that you hit me up about this in the first place was your uh, one man show video which i love that we talked about everything we did first because everything we're about to talk about will now make like more sense i think and and so for anyone who hasn't seen it it's a pretty decently decent length video with justin and it's all mostly street yeah mostly street there's a couple skate uh, quarter pipe clips in there right yeah there's a kind of the remnants of the backyard a little transition well basically the backyard mostly died 
Mm-hmm. We lit it all on fire. <laughs> nice. Put a clip of it at the end of the DVD, and then saved two ramps. And then uh, I was just living back at home for four months before I moved provinces to BC. So we set up like a make makeshift box jump, and I self filmed a couple clips in there. Yeah. And then there's a another couple skate park clips, but mostly street. That's yeah. kind of what I'm mostly trying to ride these days. So the video is pretty, it's all creative, unique stuff using different objects and obstacles like cones and other things that are there. And uh, it's really cool. And I talked about this in my news video when I talked about it, how you have like this thing, like the base level trick. I can't give an example because none of the tricks can be explained in less than five minutes. (laughs) <laughs> they're all so complex and crazy but but you have this thing and then you zoom out and it becomes another thing after the thing and i appreciated it so much just because i i can relate to that too and then there's just the you have to be able to appreciate the forethought in the what goes into it so so what i want to know is i feel like i already know the answer because i kind of try to do unique stuff too but but how much of that after thought of or not after thought but the after the main trick part of things came before and after like you were there actually doing it like was any of it planned um yeah so i kind of break it down this way this is like maybe a nerdy view of it but um when i think about filming something or a stunt or whatever it is, there's sort of three phases to it. There's what I call R and D research and development. (laughs) Okay. And then there's like proof of concept. So R and D is just figuring out what the pieces are, trying to like experiment and whatever, goof around with it. Proof of concept is you've like linked enough things together and you got close enough to landing it that you know it's like viable Mm -hmm. and it's like possible and then execution is like all the work to put in to actually film the thing and do it yeah so the way my brain works is i'm one of those guys that has a notepad by my bed and i'm always getting up at night and writing ideas down so some of those come from that like i'll just be thinking about i don't know how the brain gets there but like a spot and then I'll be like oh what if I did that or sometimes I'll just go out spot hunting and I'll just go out riding yeah and then I'll just like sit there with something and then sort of experiment or just like look at a spot for a really long time before I do anything and so that's kind of that yeah that like R&D kind of phase and then yeah like I said I have a notebook so I'll write the ideas down most ideas don't get completed they don't work or it mm-hmm. takes too long or you just have so many ideas you got to prioritize so that's my approach and then yeah self filming is a lot easier because you don't have to rely on lining up schedules with someone to film you and you have sometimes you have no idea how long these things take right so i usually start with ideas sometimes i'll be out filming something already and then I just come up with something brand new as I was experimenting Mm -hmm. and okay this won't work but oh no what about this idea and it could be connected it could be totally different and um, yeah proof of concept is just nibbling around with it setting up the tripod there's tons of different uh, tests in terms of like getting the trick right but then also figuring out how I want to shoot it so I'll play with that and then once that's all locked in then okay execution phase it's just a matter of will and skill and how long you'll stick it through and trying to learn what you're doing wrong in a trick which is usually the hardest part yeah going to work making it happen that was quite a long video and that's quite a long process for street riding just based on the fact that it's really easy to get kicked out of places well, it's, it's not that you don't get, I find you don't really get kicked out much when you're alone. It's just when you're with, like, I get kicked out way more when I'm with a group of people. Um, but when I set up with a tripod and it's just by myself, people are kind of curious. Hmm. It doesn't look threatening. It's yeah. like, 
oh, this guy has a camera and a tripod. He must be not like professional, but um, trustworthy or something. Yeah. So, and I usually don't ride spots with that are when I'm self filming, especially. They're more often it's a school after school hours in the evening or on a weekend or an industrial park. Coming. Um, there's just less traffic, less people around. So. Yeah. Yeah. That's so interesting. And I guess thinking back on a lot of the stuff you do, not a ton of it is like harmful to the thing you're riding. A lot of what you're doing isn't really like destructive. The same yeah. way as like, it's not like you're like grinding a rail, like putting pegs re like on a marble, like sub bank to sub or just some way that you could destroy things. But, but that's really interesting to hear that people are more curious. I feel like you could talk your way through something a lot easier alone too. Yeah, I, I'm trying to think, like, even filming that video, I don't know if I got kicked out anywhere. Wow. I don't know. Most of it was filmed here um, in Abbotsford, where I live now. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some older footage that was from Edmonton. The video is like two and a half years of footage, but yeah. I'd say 75% of it is, was from 20, like late 2020 and then into 2021. And um, yeah, I I think out here in BC, there's kind of a little bit more of an outdoor culture. Yeah. Given the weather's warmer year round. Uh, sometimes I'll say this to, again, kind of a non BMX audience, but this idea of outdoor culture in say Europe versus North America is very different. So you go to Europe in certain countries People are just outside doing things all the time. Young people goofing around. Um, you don't have to look like you're like, you have an objective and there's no harm in loitering really. Like yeah. you're just sitting, enjoying being outside. Like for example, in Germany, there's flat ledges that just have coping on them just cause. Huh. Or, and then here in North America, we don't really have an outdoor culture. People do some outdoor stuff, but when people come home, they make dinner, they might sit in front of the TV, whatever. And then you see like a bunch of young people outside gathered, usually men in the BMX community. Yeah. Sometimes, when, but especially if it's men, people are like, oh, what are all these young guys doing? Like, they must be up to something. And then mm. obviously the stereotype brain kicks in and they fill in all these blanks that may or may not be true about people. So I think. Yeah, in BC, we have a bit more of an outdoor culture than I'd say Alberta. Um, but then you go to places in Europe and you could be 20 people sitting outside grinding the ledge all day long with tons of people walking by and there's nothing wrong with that in society's view. So. That's so crazy and so different than here. I feel like in the town I live in, you can't get away with that kind of stuff because people all feel like they have power and they think that you're if you you don't own that that's not your property you're destroying that no matter what you're doing so it's just you can't be here well, leave yeah so i think the whole idea of like security and liability that's like huge here too and I, in north america canada and the u.s like the fear of getting sued in lawsuits which doesn't happen from BMX riding like right no skateboarder or BMXer is gonna sue a property manager because they got hurt grinding a rail that doesn't like that doesn't happen right but anyways it's the fear of it or obviously they, they they're concerned about their property and I get that like you don't want to just like intentionally damage someone's stuff when there's a like it costs something yeah um, but yeah here there's definitely like we, you hear the same line, like it's private property, you're trespassing, whatever. But I just generally don't get that when I ride alone. When <laughs> I ride with a crew, like if we, most of my friends are in Vancouver, so we'll go riding around Vancouver and yeah, you get kicked out lots and you hear the same spiel. Yeah. But when you're on your own with a tripod, there's like something different. Like you just seem way less threatening. A school project. I'm, I'm filming a school project. Leave me alone. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. I'm taking my senior pictures. All right. <laughs> yeah. And I think, uh, like you said earlier, it obviously depends on what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, how much damage or noise or chaos are you causing? How many people are around? Are you a safety risk to them? Like, could you run your bike into them? Is your bike bailing into the street? Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. When uh, I was thinking about that, people might have heard I was pulling up just to double check. Uh, it made me think about that parking block video. Hmm. Just because, like, the concept of riding those parking blocks and the curb cuts and the things that you hit, like, you're not hurting anything by doing that at all actually i got kicked out once for riding a parking block filming that video here in abbotsford <laughs> wow but i i uh it was at like a there's some like addictions uh mental health center and i think when i was there that evening um they were doing some session or something for people so uh i was just riding this parking block there yeah. and then there's a security guard and he said he just told me to leave or whatever and then I was like okay yeah that's totally fair like I'm not gonna distract or whatever right right that's interesting um so in going back to this one man show video two and a half years of self filming for a video that's crazy and so and a lot of it I'm sure took quite a while to do like what's your what's your I, you already talked through your thought process of coming up with tricks and things, but how much of it do you work out before you even get there? I mean, you said that there's the, the question I want to ask, like, what percentage of that video came from your ideas directly? And it was ex like you had it figured out before you even went there and just had, you just went and did it or figured worked through your process to make it happen. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's hard to quantify. I don't know. There's so many, like you have, I, there's so many ideas I write down that just don't work. Right. I know that. Then, I know that feeling. And you just have to kind of be okay with that. Or, or you, because they don't work, like you figure out why they don't work and then you adjust it so that it's possible. Mm -hmm. like you, yeah, you would go into something expecting to do all these pieces, like you're, there's multiple pieces to the combo. And then, okay, no, that's just so unrealistic. It's going to take me days. And then you just have to, like, taper off ideas. So, yeah, I don't know. It's hard to quantify it. That two and a half years is a bit misleading because I didn't anticipate actually making a full self-film video in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Those were just uh, some self-film clips I was probably going to sit on for our next Weird and Reviewed DVD. Oh, yeah. And then I started to get so much footage, especially after I moved and... I was kind of in a new, living in a new place and excited about spots. And where I live right now in Abbotsford, there aren't many riders. Most of everyone's towards Vancouver. So I just naturally end up riding a little more. And I, I was starting to accumulate clips relatively fast. And then I said, okay, well, I'll just make a whole self film video because I don't want half my DVD part to be self filmed. That would look kind of weird. Mm -hmm in a crew video so but yeah i started to take it seriously in uh like the beginning of 2021 gotcha so, yeah like you said like 75 percent of it was filmed in probably about a year's time but there's some old stuff there from before there's a lot of stuff that's so cool and how you use the environment and and then utilize the trick at the same time was it all there already or did you did you set anything up once you got there uh, it's a mix sometimes I do set stuff up um, like if there's a I see a pylon like I'll move it to where it needs to be mm -hmm. uh, I've been the last few years I've been goofing around with skateboards a lot yeah just using your brake and then putting your tire on the board so that's like definitely uh, an obstacle I can do whatever I want with. Right. Um, yeah, other other than that, like if it's a chain with a piece of plastic on it, there's some clips with that, like that was there. Right. Um, I'm thinking of like the, uh, for example, there's two different examples of this. The one where you fakie, you go through the gate, then you fakie the gate or whatever it is, the chain link 
fence gate. Oh, yeah, those, yeah. And, but obviously you can't set that up. But then there's yeah. other clips where it's like the, I don't remember if there were cones or something, but there was two things and then there was something connecting them. Oh, that like, was oh. there. That one was, yeah, the one with the rope across the... Yeah. Most, yeah, that was there. And then the only thing, like it was sitting there to block off those parking spots. Mm -hmm. And then I just put them at the right distance from the right. curb obstacle so that the fakie worked properly. Nice. So I don't have any shame in modifying me either a spot or using some random my friends call them toys they're like justin's just got to pull out all his toys <laughs> whether it's a skateboard or like a like a dolly thing with wheels or, mm -hmm. so Not yeah crazy. if i got an idea and i need a piece of equipment or a tool or some garbage <laughs> to make it work i'll set it up and like, i don't care well i mean that's the, the one thing that i feel like i learned through riding with hamilton a lot was just you'd get to a spot in an area and like he's i think we are he already knew where we were going to go to certain spots so like he already knows the spot but we'll get there and he'd just like look he'd be staring and then i remember one time specifically we get to the spot we're riding and i'm just like hanging out riding this little bank to parking block before we ride the other the real setup and i look around like he's just gone like where do he go and then he comes back with his skateboard wheeling this like fake brick wall thing <laughs> like I'm like what he, because he's just cruising around looking for something to add to the spot or make something different or unique or i don't know what his mindset on or the reasoning behind it is but he's just finding things in the area that add to it and like we set that up and it made it into a completely different spot so i could totally relate to that and no shame whatsoever in anything like that yeah i think uh mike pastroni is probably like the pinnacle of that with this like building street spots that didn't exist like right so they look unique or colorful in a clip or they look more natural like i think that's super cool if you can if you can if there's something you know that doesn't exist or it's like almost impossible you'd ever find it but you have mm. the idea who cares? Like, make it happen. It doesn't, I don't know. That's my philosophy on it. His, his headlight section was like that. But then you see his most recent video that just came out. Yes, and you yeah. and you look at the spots in that and like comparing the two all the whole entire time. I was just like hunting for like, did he set that up? Like, did he make that and just make it look like it was there? But you look at everything and then you watch it again. And you're like, there's no way. Like, yeah. if he set that up, he's like hauling a van full of stuff to, that he found that's been sitting somewhere for 15 years because it's covered in rust. It's not like like in his headlight section where you could just see that there's certain things that are just brand new. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think in that interview he had on Dig, he was he mentioned that it was like a lot more natural setups and spots he found than his previous videos. Which i i totally respect the setting things up thing but i think it's even crazier and that much cooler that he made the video that he did and did the things that he did somehow finding all of those spots like, those were all not all but most of what he's riding are like dream lifelong spots and they're all in one video yeah yeah and that's i think that's what's so cool about street riding is you have to put in work to like find the good stuff yeah like if you want a whole video with like basic flat ledge clips or some just pretty standard banks that's kind of easy but if you want like unique obstacles to do unique things or you just want the look of the video to be different with kind of special spots like it takes so much work spot hunting oh, and yeah. uh you have to love that so yeah you can definitely tell he's one of those guys who'll put in a lot of work hunting so oh yeah that's why you don't see as much street out of me is just because like i'm so obsessed with just riding my bike and just doing tricks and having fun on it that i can't be bothered to take time away from riding to find stuff to ride <laughs> yeah. I, i'm like dude i could just go to the skate park and i have just as much fun just riding at the skate park that's already there 
Yeah, I think I what I'm trying to do is sort of get back into that because I, I have a shoulder injury I've been working through right now, and I was the opposite of what you're describing, to a fault, because my riding would mostly be going out spot hunting mm-hmm. and just pedaling around or driving. And I'm not really riding, like it's not really a workout. It's just like pedaling around and looking. Mm-hmm. And then I come up with an idea, I had my list, and then I go self film it and I do the same movement with my body for like two hours or three hours or whatever yeah. it was. And it was they were not like healthy workouts at all. And uh, now I'm like eventually pretty much from self filming that video and then this is maybe another diet trap, but a big issue with muscle loss. Um, I went through this thing navigating the medical system as I was losing a whole bunch of muscle and not really knowing why. But I was pretty much right, like, as that was happening, I still had enough strength and excitement to ride and we didn't know what was going on. Mm-hmm. And I was just pushing it too hard with the lack of muscle. Oh. And, uh, yeah, I wasn't getting full wholesome workouts. I was doing uh, lifting weights a bit, trying to make things work, but I wasn't gaining back muscle. But anyway, so yeah, now I'm trying to like re-enter that balance as I've been doing physio for my shoulder, doing just uh, weightlifting workouts, but then also just riding and trying to go to the skate park. I'm just starting to ride again, pumping around like doing a variety of moves and maneuvers on your bike because the the self-filming crazy commitment sessions is like just two hours of just like straining one part of your body like Mm. over and over over and over again and it probably goes the same thing with some of like the lip tricks and stuff you do that take a really long time it's like okay i'm just gonna like stretch my back for two hours straight the exact same way and then hope that like the adrenaline carries me through till the end and then I get the trick and then I'll just like deal with the consequences after but that only works for so long yeah don't get me wrong that's pretty much every single session I have I might be at the skate park but I'm still spending like two hours because I suffer from oh I want to do this trick and then I'm trying it and it takes a minute and then I'm like oh if I do this first I can add I can make it a line and then I figure that part out and so then I'm just, and then it slowly, I get closer and closer. So then I'm like, oh, I'll do this before that. And then I, it gets to the point where it's like an, a minute long. And, I, and then at the end of it is the original trick that I couldn't even land in the first little bit anyways. And that is every single time I ride. Is <laughs> that whole iterate, 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 iterate over and over again. So it's like what we were talking about earlier. It's something that you're really excited about. But then you just go off in these rabbit holes sometimes and it's like no you should have just like sometimes less is more like it doesn't need a million more things sometimes it does but it's i guess it it depends on what it's for like if if i'm just filming for like a random if it's not even for anything specific i'm just filming the session to be on youtube later i don't think as much about that it's more like oh i just want to do this and then i my brain adds on like 50 other things to this already hard thing but but if i'm filming a dedicated specific clip that i'm intending to use for lip lords or an edit or whatever it might be i almost i rarely add to the beginning or end of it I guess that's probably because most of what I do is so freaking hard in the first place that it it just, it would make it impossible for me to do in any, in like a reasonable amount of time. There's definitely times where it's happened, or I think most often when what you asked about happens is if I land something too quick. Exactly. Yeah. If I land, like if it's a lip Lords clip, for example, I'll just give, I'll give away one that I filmed and I'm, I put it in my bike check because I'm going to do more for it. But I did the, uh, the foof ice tap pedal 270 foof. So I was, I learned that and I was like, Oh my God, I can do this. I was figuring it out. And then I landed that once and I was like, Oh man, that was like, that wasn't bad. I guess I have to add more to it. So my idea is like, okay, I'm getting to another Fufanu again, a 270 Fuf out of this 
pedal stall. I'm just gonna go to ice and then tap pedal 270 again. And so that's where, that's the Lip Lords clip now. I have to go around twice because <laughs> the first one was too easy. And that is when that happens. Yeah, I know that feeling. It's so, human brains are so funny because you do something you think is really cool or you want to, and then it's too easy. Like you didn't, like the carrot came too quick. Mm -hmm. Like The journey to get to the carrot. The string was too short. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, and that happens so often for me. I mean, I don't know. I just, I don't know if it's like a self-torture thing because it feels like everything I do takes so long to do. And I'd, I don't, I struggle with like, is it because I suck or is it because the trick is that hard? And then if I get it too quick, I don't know if I'm like, well, I guess I got to make it harder because either I... I was too good for this trick or it or whatever I don't know well I think you're also doing riding that like do you're connecting ideas that people haven't connected yet so you have all your like foundational stock tricks mm -hmm. but maybe other people haven't connected them in the way you have so like of course to innovate takes forever I guess innovation doesn't happen quickly I guess <laughs> it's frustrating so and then i'm sure you uh, maybe you don't this is a great question to ask but for the in examples of like filming for that video and when i film stuff i get to a point where i'm like this is not even fun i'm only doing this because my brain is like you have to do this otherwise yeah. I'm, you're gonna die <laughs> do, do, yeah, where, no, do I... you have that or do you where you get frustrated where you're like oh, is this is this even fun anymore why am i doing this I, I'll give you an example of that, like the most extreme example I've ever had of that. So in the in our Weird and Revered DVD, it's called Vagabond Vlog. Yeah. There's a clip in there I self filmed in my parents' garage when those when that those ramps existed in there. Uh, it was go up a quarter, flip jam, rear tire grab, yeah. to crank flip, like as you sit in the foot jam, yeah. and then go out fakie. And uh, I've done both those pieces separate, like a foot jam rear tire grab and then a foot jam crank flip, but I hadn't connected them. And uh, cumulatively, that clip, and it's not even like the best, hardest thing I've done, took 25 hours. Wow. And I had to go, like, I lived in Edmonton, and so I'd go and, like, visit my parents for dinner, like, maybe once a week or once every couple weeks. And then I'd go and, like, ride in the shop and try to sell film this clip and it wasn't even something i was that excited about at the very beginning i thought oh this will just be like an hour of time maybe two hours or whatever yeah. and like i kept not landing it and i'd like i'd go home drive home from i think there was like maybe four or five no probably more than that like six trips seven trips to go and film this thing wow and every time we like, why am I bothering? Like, this isn't even that cool, like, in, at least in my radar of what I want to do. Mm -hmm. But I was like, if I quit, like, what does that say about me? What does that say about me? <laughs> I can't <laughs> quit. I'm not allowed to quit. <laughs> and so it just came, became this, like, metaphor for, like, I don't know, identity. <laughs> I, I totally get it, man. It, I, you know, I think we're, well, this is like therapy for us right now. I think we, I just had a breakthrough. I think that the reason I do that is like, it's like a struggle to identify with yourself and just make sure that you're still yourself. Like you, you're finding yourself through these things and just making sure that you still are who you are. Yeah, yeah, it's a character thing for sure. But at the same time, I think there's like, there's definitely growth and wisdom of knowing when to quit and like when to move on and when to be okay with that. And I definitely don't have the balance on that figured yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, me either. <laughs> I don't, I don't, you probably won't. It, it so. doesn't exist. It because <laughs> because if you quit, it either means that it was too hard and you can't do it. It's impossible. Which I feel like us as BMX riders 
are have a very firm grasp on our what is possible for us at least once you've been riding for long enough so mm-hmm. like that one's not usually it and if it is you're okay with it because you're like well it was impossible it's just never gonna work or it means that you weren't good enough and i don't know anyone who rides like we do and films like we do who is just okay with not being good enough <laughs> yeah it's true and and it's weird i don't and you said how you live in a town where you kind of have to ride by yourself a lot but i don't know how the scene is where you ride at but like i ride at rays all the time where there's all these different people and it's so funny whenever you hear someone talking about trying a trick and they're like oh i tried it like 20 times and i couldn't do it and i'm like dude 20 is like good for me (laughs) 20 is a quick one and and so the it's like the opposite of what i'm talking about these people are like okay with not i i don't know what that's like (laughs) at the same time though like those people who are like over it at 20 I think there's still something kind of admirable in that too, is that, how do I connect this idea? It's sort of like being present when you're riding. So, you know, when you go for a session with friends and you don't film at all, maybe you bring the camera, but you don't pull it out and you just mm-hmm. goof around and ride and like, you're there and you're like there with people. Yeah. When the camera comes out, even if it's someone filming you and you're like in the zone for the trick, you're present only with that because if you focus on other stuff it's harder you won't yeah. see and so I think there's still something pretty cool about those more like casual riders now, I don't actually don't want to use that word because they could be insanely passionate about riding yeah but they're okay with like not uh, they don't need a list of achievements and I mean that in the sense of just a clip right. or a video card or whatever right that's cool too like there's there's definitely beauty in that as well and sometimes like i i try to be a little more intentional about that like okay i'm not gonna like bug my friends to film this today and we're just gonna ride Mm -hmm. Uh, other times it's the opposite but i think uh yeah the balance there is good or either approach is good it just depends how you look at it there's just there's nuance in it there's nuance in every aspect of bmx that's why it's freestyle and that's why all of it is cool in its existence and and it's funny that you brought up like sessions where you're not filming and stuff i've been filming for so long and filmed so much that i just film literally everything at this point so like i have friends who literally like sometimes they, they've relied on it they've like they just knew i was gonna be filming <laughs> so it was yeah. like they don't have and then for me i just set up my tripod so that i don't have to ask people to film so that like <laughs> It, it that the the sessions that are chill and you're where you're just goofing off are still filmed for me and and it's just it's just documenting it at this point totally my my approach with it and the yeah everyone's approach is different but um i always go riding with the cameras when i'm with people mm-hmm. if i go riding by myself uh, sometimes I'll just go to ride and I don't bring the cameras at all. I pedal around without a backpack and just yeah. for the women of it. And then I'll ride and self film and I'll bring the bag. But whenever I'm with people, no matter what, cameras always come with me, but they don't have to come out. Yeah. And uh, as I've gotten older, I'm definitely way more of like a quality versus quantity approach. Yeah. Um, so if I see someone do something, I'm like, oh, that's a DVD clip or like that would be really there's something really unique to this or mm-hmm. okay would you want to, do you want to film it do you want to film it like that'd be sweet like let's let's film it i'll film it right now and then i because i care so much about how it looks I'm, and i want it to be filmed right and whatever i'll like spend the time and put the effort in You're right but uh i definitely am trying to just if i pull the camera out like make sure it counts yeah i think absolutely the best ones are where you just you get the camera out without even like giving someone an option of or like asking if they want it film like sorry this is happening you're already doing it i'm filming it because this is way too good to not yeah those ones are awesome um what i was trying to get at that i totally just lost my train of thought on before is that like even though i'm filming 
most of the time I've it's become that filming and being present in the moment are like the same thing for me it it's weird but I, it's how it's been for me since I was 13 I've literally filmed everything since I was 13 pretty much yeah, <sighs> yeah for me too like the riding and filming are the same thing yeah like I'm not just a BMX rider. I'm not just a filmer. Like those two things are like kind of one and the same to me. Cause like right. I said, I bring the, connect, the cameras out every single time, unless I go for just a solo cruise or, around the neighborhood or at a park. Yeah. So yeah. And some people that, that things shooting photos or I don't know, maybe there's other pieces as well, but so after I hide these freaking spam porn bots in the chat, <laughs> uh, what are you working on now? Like, what's what do we have to look forward to other than we know Project Spoke will be coming eventually? Uh, what's going on now? You said you were working on a DVD, but that's more long term. Yeah, Pro Project Spoke, I'll get back to filming it. Uh, I'm leaving in July, and that'll be in uh I start in California, LA, San Diego area, and then we're gonna do, some of us are gonna do a road trip from there to through Vegas, just for a couple of days, Salt Lake City. Let's be spending a bunch of time there for some docks with uh, two different riders. And then going to the East Coast, like Philly, New Jersey, um, that area. And when that whole project's done at this point, I have no idea. Yeah. Like, I thought I had a clear timeline on it and then, and I was like not working at that time. Like I left my job with when COVID before COVID started, when I started this project, I wasn't working. I was like, I'm not going to work for this amount of time so I can finish the project. And then that all blew up. With COVID. <laughs> yeah. So I work a normal job now. So it's just, when can I put in the hours to edit and whatever? So right now I don't really know when that'll be done, but it'll be done one day yeah and then uh the weird and weird dvd it's kind of hard now because my friends all live in different places mm. like i got my buddies in vancouver our little crew here um but then a bunch of guys are in edmonton others are in different parts of bc one friend like moved to the other side of canada so everyone's kind of split apart so that'll just sort of be when people have enough footage it'll kind of be done yeah and then um yeah those are the main ones the colony arizona video will come out on monday then there's some bike checks and stuff with people those will come out after and yeah once my shoulder's good i definitely am super eager to get back to self-filming my brain's like way overstimulated because i haven't been riding yeah yeah I've been doing uh, some of the R and D sessions <laughs> going to a spot, and I'll, usually, like on a good day, I'll, like max like three ideas from a spot is like really really good. But now, like just the other like three days ago, I went to a spot that I never really spent much time at, but I knew it was there, and I had eight ideas. And I'm like, oh man, like I gotta I gotta go. I want to ride. I want to ride. But yeah, I just gotta wait till my shoulder's good. I haven't rode for four months now wow working through this injury so that's probably tendon injury in my shoulder but i'll be back at that and then yeah those are the that's, that's what I, there might be oh and then i do stuff on the our canadian bmx website it's called the northern embassy so oh yeah articles and uh stuff like that so i always have projects on the go I joke sometimes that one one day I don't know when it is or if it'll ever happen that I'm gonna try to like take a year off and do nothing. Huh. I'll still ride, but like no projects, like just to force myself to try to fully be present and 
I don't know if that'll ever happen because I don't know if my brain's hardwired for that. But. That will be tough because you'll be sitting there and you won't be present for a while because of the fact that you'll be like, I should be filming this, I should be doing yeah. this, I should be doing that, and you won't be focused on a thing. But you, after over time, you could probably train yourself, but then it might be hard to go back. Yeah, my very like idealistic version of this um, would be to like go to another country for a year. Yeah like a probably just a place that doesn't cost much cost much day to day have my bike with me my wife with me and just exist there yeah and work if i needed income i work mostly online so it doesn't i'm not really tied to a place but and uh yeah no projects i could i can have the bike maybe the cameras but then i'd probably just be too inclined yeah to do it so I don't know. Maybe one day that'll be a fun experiment, but I can't see it happening anytime soon. Whew, man. Well, it's been a good conversation. I feel like we've learned a lot. I love going into these things, not really knowing much about somebody and then coming out of it feeling like I know quite a bit. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. When, uh, one of these days our paths will cross so we can ride together. That'd be, uh, that'd be fun. Make sure we have like, a week worth of time so that we can both land all our tricks. <laughs> I'll be I'll be a, not fully in your part of the world, but when I'm on the East Coast, that'll be the closest I'll be to you in late July. But that's still pretty far from Ohio. Yeah, we'll we'll cross paths one day. We'll ride. Yeah. It'll happen. It'll happen. I'm confident. Uh, that being said, where can people find you on the internet? Yes. Um, I made a personal Instagram account back in December. <laughs> I resisted that for as long as I could, but I, uh, I realized that that kind of became important to yep. promote my stuff. So uh, that's at justinschwanka.mp4. And I made a portfolio website at the same time. So that's www.justinschwanka.com. And then I put like my whole archive of all the stuff I've made is on there. Videos, photos, articles, podcast stuff, and so on. So. Cool. So basically, if you want to see anything that Justin here has ever made, other than maybe the pink bike stuff, is it on there? There's like a section where it says, all the old videos can be found here. <laughs> ah, so you can find it. There you go. They're findable. And I have no shame in all those old ones. There's, yeah. I, in the same exact way, I have an old YouTube channel. People can find it. The only thing you won't find on there are old uh, metal screaming cover videos that I did when I was 15. <laughs> those don't exist on the internet, and I'm glad I turned them off before people figured it out. <laughs> very smart <laughs> yeah that being said check him out he's got a lot of stuff out there if you haven't seen any of it and uh subscribe here if you haven't we'll see you tomorrow for another video good night everyone thanks so much Brent. yes thank you too boom we're out <laughs>